In previous videos, I've said something along the lines of I love Warcraft 3 because of many reasons. However, none of which have anything to do with the online multiplayer mode. Total War, but that's strategy and I really don't like those games. Now, with the risk of sounding like a politician, I was completely and utterly wrong to say such a thing. But hey, at least I didn't have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. All kidding aside though, I have nothing but respect for strategy games. They're just too time consuming and complex for the free time I have. I also carry a deep, deep admiration for the genius developers that think of all that complicated math and balance everything out in a strategy video game. I cannot even begin to fathom what it means to try to come up with all those stats, damage numbers, HP, in-game resource allowance or gathering, units, counter units, implement entire economies, political warfare, warfare warfare, religious consequences and everything else that goes into a strategy game. So now, the time has come to embark on a journey into the past and find out how this genre evolved from a couple of bits on the screen to what we now call state-of-the-art graphics and mechanics. This is how strategy games evolved. Our first pit stop is ancient, well, ancient everywhere almost, because I'm referring to such places as Rome, Greece, Egypt, the Levant, and India, where there are documented cases of strategy games being played. One of these games is the famous, well, 5,000 years ago famous, Mancala. One of the oldest strategy games known to mankind that is still being played to this day. So as a quick side note, in my opinion, real life Tribal War was actually the first strategy game ever played by mankind, but the respawn system was a bit buggy back then and usually it meant game over. <laughs> Chess is another old time popular strategy game that just doesn't want to go away. I'm not kidding, even chicks are into chess now. Okay, so now that we're done with the boring stuff and covered the entire two ancient strategy games ever to be created, it's time to leap forward in time to a more modern era and talk about Risk, the board game. It was invented in 1957 by some Frenchy ass nerd and the game started an entire genre on its own, among which is the famous Settlers of Catan. A couple of decades later and Magnavox Odyssey, the electronic game of the future, is taking the world by storm. Nah, I'm kidding, it sold like 350,000 units and adjusted to inflation, in 2019 it would have cost over 600 bucks. But we're not here to debate price and crappy marketing, because we're heading over to Invasion from 1972, which was basically risk for consoles. But seeing it play out, the words what the hell were they thinking come to mind. Because you had to glue the map to the TV screen, like literally, the actual game had to be played separately on the physical board. Um, after witnessing this gaming miracle from the 70s, all I have to say is... No. The Apple II. Small, inexpensive, simple to use. Now, switching to Steve Wozniak's love child, the Apple II was enjoying a huge rise in popularity and with it came video games. Strategic Simulations Inc, founded in 1979, was one of the biggest developers out there and during their lifespan they created over 100 titles. I mean literally, go and scroll down their wiki page, it just doesn't end. It goes on and on and on and on and oh, oh there it goes. And among all of these, Computer Bismarck was an important landmark because it was fully playable on the PC and it featured AI opponents. No scotch tape required, thank god. It was a turn-based computer war game in which players had control over the British forces against the battleship Bismarck. The game's concept was actually pretty cool because the German forces were controlled not only by an AI named Otto von Computer, lame, but by another player as well. Moving on to 1981, Atari stepped up to the plate and made Eastern Front 1941. It was so advanced that it simulated terrain, weather, supplies, unit morale and even fatigue. Creative Computing Magazine actually named it their game of the year in 1981. Another important game was Reach for the Stars from 1983. It was so well designed that it could be considered the grandfather of 4X games, that's short for Explore, 
expand, exploit and exterminate. It was pretty complex to be honest, but the entire game kind of played out in your head more than on the screen. I don't know about you guys, but to me it's really funny to think that there are actual people out there going like, those were great times. Them were the best times. Anywho, some other games followed, but they're not important to our plot, so I'll just skip ahead to Empire. Another title inspired again by Risk that saw the birth of its development in 1977 and initially sold the whopping to copies. However, after enough ports, it got so popular that in 1996, Computer Gaming World magazine named it the 8th best computer game ever released. But was Empire indeed one of the most groundbreaking games to have ever existed? Who cares? Well said, Alec Baldwin. Empire was important because it inspired a guy named Sid. Sid the Stallion. <laughs> no, 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 not that Sid. But the Sid that makes us rise to the challenge and become something greater than ourselves. Civilization. Back in 1982, Sid Meier was founding Microprose together with some other guy, name or face, not really important, and started developing everything but strategy games. Now really, check this out. We have some naked guy in a jungle platformer, a crosshair that's trying to shoot yellow smudge that should be a plane, an attempt at the Formula 1 game, and some helicopter action game that to me basically yells out... So let's skip ahead to 1991 when Sid Meier and a way more important guy than his ex-partner named Bruce Shelley came up with a little game called Civilization. Now, for those of you who don't know about the game that defined the forex genre, it's pretty simple. You control an entire human civilization over the course of several millennia and do all sorts of fun activities like urban development and exploration, all the while making decisions like establishing forms of government, set tax rates and prioritize research. You compete with an AI and you can either make nice with it or end up eradicating each other from the face of the planet. See? Simple. Later on in 1994, Microprose published UFO Enemy Unknown or otherwise known as the original XCOM that is so popular and amazing nowadays. This first iteration of the series didn't just come out of the blue, it evolved from the previous works of their creator, but XCOM far surpassed each one and that's what propelled it to such popularity. The gameplay took place within two viewpoints, so to speak. The first one was this planetary zoomed out view called Geoscape. Here you basically manipulate XCOM bases, equip aircrafts, order supplies, soldiers, scientists, engineers, conduct research, upgrade equipment and sell alien artifacts on the black market to fund your little shield initiative wannabe. The second viewpoint is called Battlescape and in short, this is where the combat happens. You order your little pixelated soldiers to wreak havoc upon thine enemies in an isometric turn-based manner. That's the basic gist of the first ever XCOM. Afterwards came Civilization 2 or Civilization 2000 as it was named internally, but the game wasn't designed by Sid Meier. And if you're curious about why he didn't have a main role, in an interview for Eurogamer he simply said that he was exhausted after doing the first one. Civilization 2 was so popular that Activision even published it on the PS1. By 2001 it sold over 3 million units and it rightfully won its place on all sorts of best games of all time lists. Afterwards, Sid Meier and other important people left Microprose and founded Firaxis. They obviously couldn't use the Civilization license for their next game, but they gazed towards the stars themselves and made Alpha Centauri. It was basically Civ, but in space. Now, the kind folks on the interwebs say that this was a really, really good 4X game. They took some Civ principles and replaced them with even cooler concepts. For example, there were no more nations per se, but complex factions that adhered to certain ideologies. Thus, the game was fresh for one and all, new and old. And now the time has cometh to forego virtual board game ripoffs for a new type of video game that was slowly but surely evolving alongside the forex strategy games. And for that we must venture backwards in time to 1982 when the mullet was king and publisher Strategic Simulations Inc was releasing Cytron Masters. And even though it was simple in concept, it is considered to be one of the first games ever to be a biological grandfather of the RTS genre. 
Basically, you used some form of energy to create robots and they fought each other. Very, very high-end stuff indeed back then. But much like with Cronus and his son Zeus, this old and decrepit fool was outshined by one of its offsprings. So came to be the Age of Herzog's Vi, a true real strategy game. It was released in 1989 in Japan and in 1990 in the United States and Europe on Sega's Genesis or otherwise known as the Sega Mega Drive outside of North America. Yeah, on console. I know, shocker. Herzog's Vi actually looked quite cool. You flew a transformer around and, you know, went on your merry way and shot at other things for some good narrative reason. What's cool about it is that the player could have given orders to other units and make them patrol an area, occupy a base or attack an enemy. You could even heal them apparently. The game played out in real time and had micromanagement, a resource economy and other nice things that ultimately inspired the greatest RTS games from the 90s like Dune 2, Warcraft, Command and Conquer and Starcraft. Oh and another thing, some people call it the precursor to MOBAs cause you know you basically had one hero unit and some other units. I, I, I don't know, I don't really even care if that holds up or not. Anyway, where was I before I interrupted myself? Ah oh, yeah, Herzog Zwei inspired these amazing 90s RTS games. More specifically and chronologically, Dune 2 that rose out of the sands and took the RTS formula to the next level. It even featured the fan favorite sandworms and also had crappy weather, cool units, choose your mission type of campaign, basically sugar spice and everything nice. In 1993, Computer Gaming World said that it's a real gem with arguably the most outstanding sound and graphics ever to appear in a strategy game of its kind. So yeah, Doom 2 was the bomb back then. A bit later, in 1994, Blizzard came out with Warcraft Works and Humans. It basically had everything that Doom 2 had, but the setting was completely different. The game took place in the famous fantasy realm of Azeroth and as we all know, us nerds are so drawn to this sort of escapism. Warcraft was great with its campaign and all, but what actually made it so addictive and kept this game alive was the online multiplayer. Well, over land anyway. But as Warcraft was busy being adored and cherished by the public, the little elves at Westwood Studios, the kind folk that made Dune 2, started to plot and scheme in the shadows and pits of darkness. And from the underbelly of the abyss came forth command and conquer in 1995. The emergence of CNC was like a breath of fresh air for the RTS enthusiasts because it offered players a real modern setting as opposed to the fantasy one from Warcraft. As it turns out, variety is quite good, you know. As a player, you were controlling one or two factions, the famous Global Defense Initiative or GDI and the Brotherhood of Nod. The game featured resource management by harvesting Tiberium and processing it into credits at the now renowned refinery building. Another cool feature was that each faction had its own type of units, its own super weapon and combat strategy. The GDI was heavy on large scale attacks with expensive but powerful units while the Nod preferred bigger armies with shittier units. Basically they used the kitchen sink warfare strategy. Command and Conquer is considered the RTS game that defined and popularized the genre. I mean by 2009 the entire series sold over 30 million copies. This being said, over in the blue corner, Blizzard retaliated with Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness released in 1995 in North America and in 1996 in Europe. The game borrowed and successfully implemented some elements from the CNC game like the click and drag to select multiple units mechanic. But on top of that, it also innovated through the famous fog of war mechanic that brought a great sense of risk and reward for the player. Needless to say that Warcraft 2 was a huge success. Meanwhile, CNC fans were expecting Westwood Studios to come out with Command and Conquer 2, but in 1996 they came out with the alternative history one called Red Alert. You remember, the one where Hitler never happened and the Soviet Union was the enemy. Moving on to 1995, the granddad of my favorite turn-based strategy game came into existence. Heroes of Might and Magic, a strategic quest. The game's setting was this medieval fantasy realm where the player was called a hero and he was basically the general over a weird ass army made out of humans and mythological creatures like the mountain from Game of Thrones, some native American horse thing, okay, and my first girlfriend. Now don't get me wrong, she didn't look like that, on the outside at least. It was a great game that laid the foundation upon which the greatest of the heroes games was built in 1999. 
because every true fan knows that after Heroes 3, it all went downhill. We don't know why, we don't know when, we don't know whom, but... It is known. It is known. Now, the year is 1997 and Total Annihilation was giving it its best to compete with these two titans. What it brought to the table were fancy bells and whistles like 3D terrain and land spiders. It was really well received and got numerous awards, among which was GameSpot's 1997 Game of the Year award. The editors stated that it's not as famous as Warcraft or Command & Conquer, but Total Annihilation is arguably better than any other real-time strategy game to date. So yeah, it kinda had its own thing going on. But now we're moving on to the mind of the French version of Johnny Ive. Welcome to the end of curiosity. Remember him? He used to bullshit a lot, made black and white, Fable and that moronic cube event on smart devices where nothing actually happened. Well, the very same douchebag made Dungeon Keeper, which was actually a pretty cool concept. You played as the bad guy for once and had to defend your dungeon from the mythical hero out for glory and booty or whatever. Basically, it was a god game. It was funny, it had charm, but unfortunately it didn't blow up in sales. Now, remember when I talked about Sid Meier and Bruce Shelley that made Civilization together? Well, in 1992, old Brucey left Microprose and joined Ensemble Studios. What did he do there, you might ask? Well, Age of Empires, published by Microsoft in 1997. This game was kind of a combination between Civilization and Warcraft. You had resource management, unit production, multi-purpose structures, warfare, all the while evolving your people from a hunter-gatherer society to a more refined one that enslaved people with religion and superstition of sorts. Age of Empires was an instant success. It was released in 55 countries during its first four months and hit big everywhere with great review scores. By 2001, it sold over 2.2 million copies worldwide. What more can I say about this game? It's freaking awesome. And if you have a PC, go buy an Xbox Game Pass subscription and just play the darn games. They're a major part of gaming history. Now, circling back to Blizzard, in 1996 at E3, they showed an early version of a sci-fi space RTS game that members of the press called Orcs in Space, because it bore a striking resemblance to Warcraft 2. And that was probably because the game was built on the Warcraft 2 engine and they got lazy or something with the character models, who knows. But what's truly important here is that Blizzard went back to the drawing board and didn't shit the bed this time. They spent two more years on that project that was finally released in 1998 by the name of StarCraft. Research complete. It was the best-selling PC game at the time, destroying everything else on the market. One funny thing about it is that by 2007, it sold 9.5 million copies across the globe, of which 4.5 million were sold in South Korea. They sure love their StarCraft there, don't they? Right. In the meantime, Westwood Studios that made CNC was acquired by EA and soon after, delays and content cuts followed. However, Tiberian Sun was released in 1999 and oh, it was glorious, graphically and commercially. Tiberian Sun hit 1.5 million units sold in one month and before the arrival of Red Alert 2, it plateaued at 2.4 million units sold. Now, taking into consideration the entire RTS trend from 1993's Dune 2 up until this point, the 90s were pretty freaking amazing for the PC with all these awesome hits populating the gaming industry and propelling it forward. But before we head into the 2000s, the era had one more ace up its sleeve. That was Homeworld, made by Relic Entertainment, a space RTS that is considered to be the first truly 3D strategy game. But Homeworld wasn't just a pretty face, because it won Best Strategy Game at the 1999 Game Critics Awards, and was nominated for Computer Game of the Year and Computer Strategy Game of the Year at the 2000 Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Interactive Achievement Awards. I hope I got the last one right. Furthermore, it was named Game of the Year by IGN, PC Gamer, and won Strategy Game of the Year by Computer Gaming World, while also winning Best Original Storyline and Best Original Score at the 2000 Eurogamer Gaming Globes Awards. That's all, folks. 
Damn, I'm telling you, the 90s went out with a bang in regards to PC gaming and could be considered the golden years of the RTS genre on the PC. Because soon after, consoles kinda started flooding the market and the mouse and keyboard saw a decline in its public that was slowly shifting to the controller, especially the PlayStation 2. And along with that mass player exodus came the migration of the developers as well. So all of a sudden, renowned strategy game developers weren't only focusing on RTS games, but they started to adapt to the needs of the many. Along with this transition, where the experiments soon followed. Like Sacrifice from 2000, for example, that was a third-person real-time strategy game. It got high praises from the press for being a great game, also for the shiny new graphics, special effects, artistic design and so on, but it wasn't a commercial success, and some of the main reasons for that are attributed to poor marketing, time of the release, and to the fact that it was developed by four guys that didn't take into account the needs of the many when it came to the overall player experience. These reasons altogether made it quite the niche product. So yeah, unfortunately Sacrifice, as impressive as it was, failed to reach an audience and therefore got lost forever into the abyss of history. Now let us shift the paradigm from the end of one game to the birth of a new franchise. Shogun Total War, developed by Creative Assembly, made its debut in 2000 and it kinda impressed everyone with its grand scale battles in real time. The surprise element, well besides the free camera that lets you see the models up close and the obvious simulation of what it would be like to command 10,000 troops, was that a dev studio finally made an RTS game that wasn't a complete ripoff of Command and Conquer. Oh, and the people loved it because it was the closest thing to Braveheart on the market. And Let's face it, we all want it to feel like They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! <laughs> Anyway, Total War grew and grew over the years and shows no sign of stoppage. Cause in the summer of 2020, Creative Assembly came out with Troy, a timed exclusive for 12 months on Epic Store. They also made it free to claim for the first 24 hours and during that window, it was downloaded over 7.5 million times. No one was expecting that, not even the developers. And while we're still in the realm of historical accuracy, Europa Universalis is more than worthy of a mention. The first iteration was released in 2001 by Paradox Interactive. The Europa Universalis series isn't an actual RTS per se, some might even put it under the turn-based strategy genre, but whatever the case might be, it surely belongs to the Grand Strategy wargame category. If you're not savvy or speak uber nerd, Grand Strategy is basically a long-term simulation, in our case a true to history one where political, economical and military conflict are at core, but not in the fun explosions on the screen kind of way. Here you get to stare at menus and click buttons all day long, the action playing more in your head than on the screen. On the map, or board bare foot, you get to see small figurines have at it, but as I've said, the EU series are mostly for posh smart people that like looking down at us plebs. Indeed. <laughs> And just to piss off the elitists, I'm going to include part of Paradox's roster here, cause the Crusader Kings series that started in 2004 is similar to Universalis but with variations to the formula. For example, Universalis is a more inward looking outward type of gameplay where you play for centuries as the kingdom with a focus on interacting with other countries and in Crusader Kings it's like I am the king! I will punish you and you focus more on internal politics. Oh, and there's the excellent Hearts of Iron from 2002, which is basically like the previous two I mentioned, but the time period is limited to World War II. Okay, so that should kinda get Paradox Interactive out of the way for now. So let's scroll over to 2001 and Gander at Stronghold made by Firefly Studios. I quite enjoyed this game when I was a young lad because you could set fire to the ground. Fire played an active role in the game. In Starcraft for example, when a building caught fire, it was more of a visual eye candy cue so it would let the player know that he was kicking ass. But here, setting things ablaze was a core mechanic of the game that impressed my 11 year old mind immensely. Needless to say that it was well received and the legacy of Stronghold carried on through the ages and still does because Stronghold Warlords is supposed to come out in 2021, or already came out if you're watching this video from the future. But back to the past in 2002, Age of Mythology was being released by Ensemble Studios. If you remember, the team behind Age of Empires, hence the similarity. It was basically Age of Empires with a Greek soundtrack and if you look close enough, you can see the uncanny resemblance it holds to Assassin's Creed Odyssey. 
Yeah, so Age of Mythology was an instant fan favorite while also performing extremely well on the market. It spawned a couple of expansion packs, but sadly no word on Age of Mythology 2. However, creative director of Microsoft Adam Isgreen said in an interview for Eurogamer at E3 2019 that, I love myth, we're not going to leave it behind, we'll figure out what to do with it then. So yeah, it might be soon, it might be never. Now, over to 2003 Rise of Nations that was a great RTS designed by one of the main peeps from Civ 2 and Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. I remember playing this and thinking it was really cool. The game featured 18 civilizations and the timeline took place through 8 ages of world history. The concept was solid because you started out during the hunting and gathering age and evolved all the way through the modern era. Now, remember Westwood Studios that made CNC, Dune Tune and was bought by EA? Well, in the meantime, they were kinda going through a major shift and not a pleasant one. First of all, they got merged and rebranded to Westwood Pacific and in 2000, they shipped Command & Conquer Red Alert 2. Later, Westwood Pacific got rebranded again, but into EA Pacific and came out with Command & Conquer Generals in 2003. Needless to say that the game was a hit. Alas, CNC Generals was the first and last strategy game that came out of EA Pacific because it got dissolved into EA Los Angeles and well, that's a different story altogether. Back to Blizzard again, but the year is 2002. Warcraft 3 came out and honestly, need I say more about it? I mean, it put the hero concept inside an RTS game to a completely different level. Basically, it took some of the addictive elements of an RPG and blended those with the core mechanics of an RTS game. However, even though Warcraft 3 was a huge landmark in the landscape of real-time strategy games, the release of the Frozen Throne expansion marked the end for the adored Blizzard series. I couldn't have said it better myself than Medivh did in my Why I Love Warcraft 3 video. And now that my task is done, I will take my place amongst the legends of the past. But as sad as this is for us fans, it didn't go out with a whimper, but with a bang. Because Warcraft 3 set the scene for the entire MOBA genre that spawned Dota and the ironically more popular clone League of Legends. Also, let us not forget that the universe from Warcraft spawned the amazing World of Warcraft which kicks ass even 16 years after its initial release in 2004. To this day, WoW is still my favorite PC game of all time. From a fantasy setting to a sci-fi universe, it's time to move the discussion to the official Orcs in Space game, Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War that came out in 2004. <laughs> that rhymes. Warhammer Dawn of War brought a series of tweaks to the formulaic real-time strategy genre. For example, there were no more micromanaging resources and sending out farmers to milk the goats. And you also didn't have to eye your economy like a hawk. You focused primarily on the battlefield and combat was the core mechanic. You even gained resources by occupying enemy territories and strategic points. These changes sound incredibly cool if you ask me for those who don't want to send their CVs to mine Vespian gases and so on. The game made by Relic Entertainment was a major success during its lifetime selling over 4 million copies by 2009. In all honesty, it does owe part of that success to the fame of the war game series that spans all the way back to 1987. But that's not everything successful that came out of the gates of the developer of Homeworld and Warhammer, cause in 2006 they changed things up and released the endearing Company of Heroes. This departure was kind of a bold risk for them because of the space fetish they had for the better half of the decade. But it all worked out in the end because this World War II real-time strategy game was beautifully constructed. It was a real looker for that age and its physics system was top-notch, giving it a more lifelike feeling. Oh, and having your units taking cover while firing and blowing up things in a great visual manner didn't hurt either. It was still a constant fight to capture the strategic points like in Warhammer, but it was the setting that made this game so popular because we men just love our World War II games, don't we? So the 2000s weren't that bad for the RTS stage when you look at the hits from that era, but no matter how well every game from that period performed critically and commercially, it still wasn't enough to bring back the success and glory of the genre from the roaring 90s. In 2005, Civilization IV, designed by Soren Johnson, revived the series and made the first 3D version of it while also adding a multiplayer experience. It was the start of a new era for the Civ games because the iterations that followed featured even more great changes. 
Star Wars Empire at War from 2006 was another great title that didn't turn the world on its head, but it got respectable review scores and it developed quite the cult following. I hardly agree with you, sir. For some, Empire at War is still the best Star Wars game they ever played. And if you're a fan and are wondering about a sequel, in this article right here, the devs pitched the idea to EA, but, well, what do you think happened? Up next, Supreme Commander from 2007 was and still is one of the all-time greats. It is regarded as being the spiritual successor of Total Annihilation and with its huge world size, the strategic zoom that is iconic to the game and the all-out epic warfare, Supreme Commander was beloved by many nerds. There was also Sins of a Solar Empire from 2008, a sort of a revolution within the 4X genre because the developers transformed the old turn-based mechanics into real time. So it basically was an RT for X. It got phenomenal review scores and sold extremely well for a game that cost under $1 million to develop. I mean, in just seven months, it sold half a million units globally. You do the math on that one. Okay, so now, Jesus Christ, why did I make such a long ass video? We're gonna skip all the way to 2012, cause in the meantime, there were just sequels worthy of mentioning. Like Red Alert 3, CNC 3, Kane's Wrath, Halo Wars, if anyone cares, another company of heroes, Stalin vs. Martians, yeah, that happened. StarCraft 2, which was and is the RTS game to play. CNC 4, another Dawn of War. Supreme Commander 2, that was a bit of a letdown for the hardcore fans of the first one because it got a lot simpler and nerds want to nerd it up, not damn. Total War Shogun 2, another Anno, which, yeah, a series I didn't mention at all during this entire video. Tropico 4, Heroes 4, bleh. And we'll stop here for now, because there's one game in particular that killed it out there, and its name is XCOM Enemy Unknown. The public immediately adored this little turn-based tactics game, and IGN, Game Informer, and GameSpy awarded it with the title of Best Strategy Game. At E3, it also won Best PC Game and Best Strategy Game. It got huge scores, and basically, XCOM was all like, I'm the best one here. I'm the best one you get a thing. But the most important thing here is that other publishers got wind of its success and started making their own tactics game like Invisible Ink by Cly Entertainment, which was a stylish success. From then on, more and more strategy games started coming out of the woodworks as well, like Endless Legend, that revitalized the dying 4X species. The lore from that game alone was like porn from the hundreds of thousands of geeks out there that were fantasizing about what it would be like to live in an alternate reality. From then on, the RTS started anew and to this day keeps soaring towards the heavens with good and great titles flooding the PC platform akin to the glory days of old. Oh, and also this is happening. Alas, now that I rambled for the better part of half an hour, and I do apologize for wasting your time if you made it this far, but since you're already here, you might have noticed that I didn't name every single strategy game under the sun because I didn't want my video to become a narrated wiki page, but maybe you'll be willing to share with the group what is your favorite strategy game of all time and maybe start a discussion. Thank you everyone for watching this video, it's finally over. This was so grueling to write and narrate. I never want to do this much research again, to be honest. But I hope you enjoyed watching it more than I enjoyed making it. And as always, we truly appreciate your support here and on Patreon, where we have our first four patrons that I shall read out loud as a huge thank you. The first ever patron to support my dreams is my dear friend Mihai Klinchanu. Then, Adrian Vasile Bordan, Equinoi... Equin... What the... Equinoi... Uh, okay. And Mortal Storm 1195. Thank you all so much for believing in our little project. You can support us as well and get benefits like early access to our videos or exclusive patrons behind the scenes videos that I will make for the $10 and up threshold. Basically, I'll take apart my edits and guide you through why I did this, that, etc. You can find the patron link in the description below. However, if you don't or can't join us on Patreon, you can still help us out with a like, hitting the sub button and the bell icon if you want to be among the first to see our new videos on YouTube. And well, that's kind of it. Thank you all and to all a good night. Stay safe.